Good afternoon, everyone. I call this meeting of the Committee on Workforce and Business Development, Finance and Policy to order. Members and the uh, public, please uh, mute your mics. This remote hearing is conducted pursuant to Rule 10.01. This remote hearing can be viewed at the House television webcast. With that, the Committee Legislative Assistant, uh, Mr. Chavez, will now take the role. Chair Noor. Present. Chair Noor, present. Vice Chair Jay Shong is excused. Lead Hamilton. Present. Lead Hamilton, present. Baker. Baker. Dabney. Dabney, present. Dabney, present. Frankie. Frankie, present. Frankie, present. Greenman. Present. Greenman, present. Haley. Haley. Jurgens. Jurgens, present. Jurgens present. Cagle? Present. Cagle present. Katiza Watoon? Present. Katiza Watoon present. Olsen? Present. Olsen present. Tu Zhong? Present. Tu Zhong present. I'm not ba on. Baker? I'm not on the screen. Baker? Haley? Haley? The chair, we have quorum. Jason, I sent you an email regarding Representative Baker. I just sent it to you, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Uh, members, we now have a quorum. Uh, with that, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes uh, for Wednesday, uh, 17th of March, 2021. So moved, Mr. Chair. Representative Jorgens moves the approval for the minutes for March 17, 2021. Any discussions? Any discussions? See none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. See none, uh, the motion prevails. The minutes for March 17, 2021 are now approved. With that members, uh, we do have five bills. We will try our best to limit uh, each bill to 15 minutes. And if anyone exceeds that, I'll, I'll be sorry to cut short the conversation so we can get moving with the next bill. So with that, we, we have House File 2066. Representative Kegel, uh, please uh, introduce your bill and uh, welcome and get started. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, I would move that House File 2066 be laid over for possible inclusion, is that correct? That's um, correct. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, there's a DE um, amendment as well. Representative Kegel, do you, did you want to move the DE1? Yes, let's move the DE1 to get the bill in its proper shape. Great. So uh, members, uh, DE1 is now moved. Uh, any discussions or did you, uh, any discussion we get to DE1? Otherwise, we will make a voice uh, vote on this. See none. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? See none. Uh, the motion uh, to adopt the DE1 prevails. With that, uh, as the bill as amended, Representative Kegel. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. So um, House File 2066 is the um, Minis Launch Minnesota program. Um, and we have um, the Commissioner Veed with us here today. So I'm actually just gonna really do a quick overview view and then leave it up to the program experts to really talk about this. But um, Launch Minnesota is focused on growing Minnesota's innovation economy by accelerating the growth of our startup ecosystem and attracting top, top technology talent to the state. It's comprised of a collection of grant programs, education and training and a statewide network to connect uh, and grow startup the startup community. Um, Launch Minnesota will build on the previous efforts of the state to support and enhance our visibility and interest in the in, in the innovation ecosystem. Um, Launch Minnesota brings together all key players, founders, venture cap venture capitalists, research, academia, business, and educators into one space. And the attention was um, originally to separate separate pieces of the in, of the in of, of the initiative from state government but currently the private sector doesn't have the capacity to take it over 
over the biennium, staff will continue to engage in businesses, higher education investors, and communities to provide resources to match state investment uh, to sustain and grow the locations and educational services available to entrepreneurs and startups beyond the biennium. And this program is still slated to spin outside, or is still is still slated to spin outside of the government and sunsets um, January 2024. So with that, I will really, uh, I'll turn it over to um, the commissioner. Commissioner Grove, uh, welcome to the committee and uh, please proceed with your testimony. Thanks, Mr. Chair, Representative Cagle. We're excited to be here to talk to you about Launch Minnesota. This is a program that was created a couple of years ago, really in partnership with both the House and the Senate, with Republicans and Democrats, and of course, the governor's office of deed, uh, with the belief that Minnesota was an inflection point, that if we begin to do more things to create the kind of environment in our state where people want to take that risk and start a new company, and they have the support in those early days to make sure it's successful, we could really accelerate Minnesota's growth and defining the next chapter of the American economy. And in the past few years, that has begun to really happen. You've seen a record amount of new venture dollars come into the state, a lot more business starts. And of course, with the advent of COVID-19 and all the challenges that has brought our state, you've seen business starts start to climb up too. And so it's been a really well-timed program to make sure that those who are using this moment of disruption in our economy to try something new, have the supports they need from an educational standpoint, have the kind of grant dollars and incentives to take that leap and start something new uh, in our markets. So we're very bullish on this program. It is at its center focused on equity and helping uh, those entrepreneurs who might otherwise be overlooked find access to these funds that is written into the statutes, both in terms of the program conception and in how we administer it. Uh, and it really helps those who might not yet be ready to get funding from a traditional venture capitalist get their companies into a place where they can start to take in that funding and build companies that, again, are going to create the kind of job we need so desperately in our state's recovery. Again, as we've talked about in this committee, all those net new jobs we're going to get to crawl out of this $416,000 job hole, as it were, are going to come from small businesses and new businesses starting and creating new opportunities. So we're even more bullish this session than we were last time on the program. We're very grateful to Representative uh, Cagle for championing this. And really, I'm going to turn it over to the team because uh, one of the best decisions we've made here at DEED is who we've hired to help build this program. And Neil Molgard, the director of Launch Minnesota, has just been a huge force of nature in making this program a success. Uh, she comes from greater Minnesota, understands the startup ecosystem well. Uh, we're thrilled for her leadership for getting this off to the ground. And um, I know she's going to hand it over to Dave Hengel and uh, Neil as well. We're going to talk a little bit about the impact the program has had. So thanks for having us. Thanks for considering this. Um, and I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Grove. Uh, the next person is Director Morgan. Uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed with, with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Noor and Representative Cagle. Uh, I'm Neela Molgard, Executive Director of Launch Minnesota. It's an honor to join all of you here today. Uh, Darielle is gonna put up a slide deck here. The, what she's gonna be sharing, it's, it's a model that really represents the holistic approach of Launch Minnesota. Startups and innovators are at our core, but all of these sectors are critical to build a strong and vibrant, innovative ecosystem. Darielle, do, do, do you see the slide deck? There, the next slide. Launch Minnesota is serving as the front door, a neutral central touch point that is bringing these sectors together to start, support, and scale new businesses and technology. We focus on three key areas, capital, culture, and talent. I'll walk you through our progress. We've awarded 2.8 million and 88 startups through our innovation grants with another announcement coming uh, shortly, which may fully allocate our second year funding already this month. This was about 28% of the dollars requested by our startups. I'm proud to share 59% of our grant awardees are from targeted populations. Minnesota's had a record year in venture capital investment deploying 1.8 billion. Launch Minnesota will continue to incentivize private investment through our grant match and other efforts. Second, we are creating a collaborative culture. States and countries that create an attractive environment for startups are surpassing those that don't. We first started 
by creating a collaborative statewide network, first of its kind hub and spoke model, bringing together these six regions, eight hubs and over 80 program partners. Regions were asked and encouraged to look outside of their organization and their city to leverage their strengths. These networks have come together, meeting on a regular cadence, leveraging programming, marketing efforts, and funding. They're customizing their local offerings, but ex accessing our statewide best practices. Due to the creation of this network, we entered a competition sponsored by the SBA, the U United States Small Business Administration, which resulted in Minnesota receiving the SBA Super Connector Award in this January along with four other initiatives across the nation. The SBA has identified that a connected and coordinated ecosystem is beneficial to entrepreneurship. And that's our goal. Third, we are working to develop talent and expertise. Through our partners, we've educated through Lean Startup Education over 635 entrepreneurs. Over 110 have received a certification also, a select group of our innovation grantees, awardees outside of the University of Minnesota system now have access to the university's expertise and one-to-one -one technical assistance through the new Discovery Launchpad MN. Launch Minnesota is creating strong pipelines and on-ramps, connecting entrepreneurs to the resources, talent, and capital they need to be successful. And the Minnesota Expert Exchange in partnership with the University of Minnesota is helping entrepreneurs find the right connections at the right time. I am really proud of the traction that we've seen in Minnesota startup ecosystem in the past year and a half since our official kickoff. 92% of grantees confirmed that they've that we've helped move their startup and technology forward. These startups are the engines of our future jobs and economic growth. We've leveled the playing field. We've increased access, opportunity, and funding to founders who are underrepresented. And we've amplified the story of Minnesota, increasing awareness across regions, the state and nationally, with a reach of over 75 million. It has been a true honor to serve in this capacity. And I now have the pleasure of introducing um, Dave Hangel, the director of Bemidji Launchpad. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Director Morgan. Um, Mr. Hangel, wait, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Greetings from up north and thanks for the opportunity to support, share my support for Launch Minnesota. My name is Dave Hangel and I'm the executive director of Greater Bemidji. Being in economic development for 35 years, I've worked with virtually every DEED program. There's none I'm more excited about than Launch Minnesota. You know, I serve on both the advisory board, but also as the regional hub for Northwest, for the Northwest region. As a board member, I've noticed as we review the grants that a vast majority have come from the Twin Cities metro area, but I challenge you, don't let that lead you to believe that Launch Minnesota is unimportant to greater Minnesota. In fact, I think it's the exact opposite. Because of greater Minnesota's regions are in its infancy in building a startup e ecosystem, I believe regional areas desperately need Launch Minnesota. In my role as regional hub, I can also observe the impact Launch Minnesota's had up north. Entrepreneurship is in the DNA of Northwest Minnesotans. Some of our Minnesota's greatest companies, Polaris, Articat, Marvin Windows, DigiKey, Team Industries, were all started by a Northwest Minnesota entrepreneur. Yet they did it without the benefit of a regional foundation to support startups. In a very real sense, in Northwest Minnesota, we are starting from scratch. With the support of Launch Minnesota's education grant, 14 regional partners have come together with a clear focus on supporting the next great startups. We've created a network of lo locally based entrepreneur navigators spread throughout our region that serve as entry points into our ecosystem. They are single points of contact and they surround the startups with the supports they need. Because of Launch Minnesota, we are working together like never before in Northwest Minnesota. We're sharing resources, we're events, expertise, and mentors, and we're connecting with the other resources that Launch Minnesota has stated, uh, created statewide. Thanks to Launch Minnesota, we are laying the foundation that will serve our region startups for many, many years. 
increasing our chance of finding that next Polaris Digikey, Marvin Windows, or other great company. Thanks for the, again for the opportunity to share my enthusiastic support for Launch Minnesota. That's the end of my remarks. Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. The, uh, the last person to testify on this bill is Ednani. Uh, Mr. Ednani, welcome to the committee. Uh, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Anila Ednani. Thank you, Chair Noor and representatives for your service to Minnesotans and for the opportunity to be here today. I am Anila Ednani, a Launch Minnesota advisor and a grantee. My husband and I moved here 11 years ago for work. Today, we are two of four co-founders of HabitAware, a mental health tech company and Time Magazine Best Invention. HabitAware is a Launch Minnesota research grantee, having recently been awarded a phase two SBIR with the National Science Foundation. This matching grant enabled us to bring on a data scientist and electrical engineer for expert consultation. As I've said many times, the work we do at HabitAware, helping one in 20 Americans suffering from compulsive hair pulling, skin picking, and nail biting would not be happening if not for our move to Minnesota. Minnesota has the trifecta of values needed to generate material prosperity. These are concentration, consistency, and cooperation. And these values are embodied in the Launch Minnesota program. Efforts are concentrated on bridging the gap in early stage funding, as not everyone has access to friends and family who can invest in their early product development. Additionally, Launch Minnesota consistently supports its grantees with events, connections, mentorship, and monthly gatherings to exchange knowledge. As well, Launch Minnesota has been instrumental in solidifying cooperation and community relationships between ecosystem builders across the state. Launch Minnesota plays a fundamental and critical role in supporting startup business innovation. The program is necessary to ensure Minnesota stays competitive nationally and internationally, and that Minnesota has the ability to attract top professional talent and spur future economic growth. Thank you for your consideration. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Nani, for uh, your testimony and the work that you're doing to contribute to the uh, innovation ecosystem to the state of Minnesota. Uh, this is a program, quite frankly, sometimes I call it, uh, you know, the basement innovators who are getting the opportunity to be on the forefront to make a big difference in our society, as you all aware of. In this world right now, everything is about the internet, everything is about technology or something that I usually call tele everything. So this is a great opportunity, it's a great program, great initiative, and I'm proud to have been part of the initial launch for this program. With that, members, I see Representative Haley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and let me know, I've been having trouble with the internet today at the state office building, so let me know if that starts happening and again. Will do. Um, um, I've watched this program closely as I had one of the uh, kind of the original um, ecosystems, Red Wing Ignite, in my community, and so have been excited to see startups originate out of my own out of my own community and seeing how this has grown in this statewide effort. Um, what what I to the other committee members, um, as you all know, I'm I'm really a public private partnership person. And that's what I really like about this initiative. It's so unique in uh, so many other things that we do at the state level in that it draws in so much private uh, equity to these efforts. And it also in doing so really breaks down barriers uh, that we often see in state government programs. Um, you know, everybody's got to come to the table in order for these entrepreneurs like Miss um, Idani to succeed. Um, so it's, it's very exciting to me um, to see this happening in our state. And I'm wondering if um, uh, Executive Director Mulgard could kind of tell us more, you know, we, we may often think about Boston or San Francisco when we think of venture capital and entrepreneurship, but can you tell us where does Minnesota rank and just um, how far we've come and the fact that this, every state's doing this now. And so we have to be a player at the table. Um, can you tell us a little more about that? Director Morgan, I just wanted also to note, I think Director Morgan, you are from the Red Wing area, which is represented by Representative Haley. Uh, please uh, uh, proceed. Yes, uh, Representative Haley, 
um, we are seeing a lot of traction here in the Midwest, especially Minnesota, uh, the, the, the investors and businesses from the coast coming here. There are many rankings. It depends on which ranking you look at. Uh, Commissioner Grove has a bold vision that Minnesota would be one of the top five innovative states in the nation. We're not there yet, but we're making good traction. But it's efforts like this that will keep us competitive nationally and globally. Professor Bailey. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No further questions. With no any further discussion or questions, I just wanted to appreciate the testimony from everyone. And I would like to give it back to Representative Kegel. Thank you, Mr. Chair members. Um, as I was hearing some of these, um, the testimony, I just kept thinking about Shark Tank. And so um, this is like our own Minnesota version of, a, of Shark Tank, which is a lot nicer, I guess. Um, but I think this is a great program and um, I really hope that we can um, get it across to the finish line. So thank you all very much. Did you want to renew your motion uh, as amended? I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll renew the motion for you. Uh, I renew, uh, Representative Cagle renews her motion. House file 2066 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion. So thank you so much. With that, we're moving to House file 784. Representative Thompson, welcome to the Workforce and Business Development. And I just wanted to move your bill uh, to uh, Public Safety, Finance, and uh, Policy Committee. And I see you also have an amendment. Yes, yeah, uh, with respect to uh, Representative Frankie, I uh, offered two amendments, uh, Chair Noor. And oh, I Representative Thompson, uh, I, I, maybe we shall start with the author's amendment, which you have, and then you can explain the bill, which is a technical amendment, which it's, changes it's the date. The amended language does two things, uh, uh, Chair. The amended language ensures that we're doing our available utilization and reporting with our affirmative action program contract procurement by each protected groups, uh, women, disabled, Black, Latino, Indigenous, Asian, veteran status versus the aggregate reporting that we have done historically. And the, the second thing it does is require a, 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 a quarterly progress report. So I ask for your support on those. Amendments. Did I lose you? A3, uh, um, the House, uh, the House uh, nonpartisan staff can briefly walk us through that. Michelle? Uh, members, Chair members, I, I believe actually Matt Rep, uh, Matt Garing is on the call to cover this bill. Mr. Uh, Matt Garing, uh, welcome to the committee and uh, uh, and address the House uh, Amendment uh, A three, please. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, yeah, Matt Garing um, from House Research, I staff the State Government Committee. Uh, as well as this bill. Um, the amendment actually is just correcting a couple of typographical errors in the drafting of the bill. I think Representative Thompson might be describing the amendment that was adopted in the state government committee um, last time. Um, so there, there were a couple of date references that were just incorrect in the bill. And so this is updating those references to fiscal year 2022. Uh, thank you so much. So this is more of a technical in nature. I just wanted to get the, the vote voice vote for this one. Uh, members, all those in favor for A3 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? See none, uh, the amendment is adopted. With the uh, amendment adopted as uh, amended your bill, uh, tell us about your bill for the section that is related to this uh, committee. Representative Thompson. You're muted, Representative Thompson, you're muted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Hey, yes. second, uh, Chair, thank you. And, and thank you uh, to the committee for hearing this historic bill. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I, I would like to just uh, highlight again that this bill actually targets uh, state appropriations statewide for the African-American, African immigrant community to build and expand capacity to address disparities by the poor administration enforcement 
of our primary equal opportunity laws made worse by the pandemic. This bill also issues funds to correct the poor administration and enforce enforcement of the primary equal opportunity laws, affirmative action, contract procurement, human rights enforcement, and to end systemic racism, uh, racial injustice, and eliminate disparities. So Mr. Chair, members, I ask for your support. Uh, this bill is section three, appropriations, uh, entrepreneurial and business training assistance. This is a $50 million ask, which I know is pretty hefty, but we know in negotiations, everything is negotiable. Um, in the fiscal year of 2020, 21, is appropriated from the general fund to the Commissioner of Department of Employment and Economic Development for grants to the African-American organizations to A, strengthen their entrepreneurial and business training and technical support, establish an African-American controlled business development in St. Paul, Minneapolis, St. Cloud, Duluth, Rochester, Mankato, and surrounding cities, uh, provide financial assistance in a usable form to African-American businesses throughout the state. This is a one-time appropriation chair and, and, and the appropriation is available until June 30th, 2024. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Thompson for that explanation for the bill. And we do have one testifier who signed up, uh, that is uh, Deputy, uh, if you, uh, if you can please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Alexander Buster, Deputy. I am a father, a husband. Of, I am a father of eight children, a husband, um, a small business owner. My, my family and I immigrated to this country almost about 30 years ago. Okay, so as a, as a black man, I am, I am quite insulted by this bill because this, this, this bill is supposed to be addressing systemic racism within our country. The issue is, is that I think this bill promotes racism within our within our country you know um when you start appropriating general funds for a specific group of people excluding others simply based on the color of their skin all right that within itself is racist you know um that within itself divides us. It does not bring us together. So case and point that because my skin color is darker than my neighbor, I am awarded something simply because of the color of my skin or Representative Thompson just said, protect the class. Aren't every single citizen supposed to be protected? Okay. So this bill within itself to me does not bring us together at all. It does not fight racism. It promotes racism. And if you guys are supporting this, you guys are pro promoting the very thing that this, this bill claims to be trying to stop or end. The other thing too is that this bill puts black people more or, or people of color back into more slavery. The very thing that we have tried to address in this country for hundreds of years, this will put us back into that. Because if we are promoting that, look, because of the color of your skin, something you have no control over whatsoever, because you have a darker skin color, you are automatically at a disadvantage. But who gets to decide that? Is it the government? 
because you don't have control over that. All right. This e essentially handicaps blacks or or people of color because they are having that mentality that because of Mr. something Dippet. I have no control over, I Mr. am Dippet. at a dis uh, disadvantage. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. I appreciate it. If you can wrap up, uh, because I know we do have uh, other discussions and build an amendment. Uh, okay. So, um, so wrapping it up is that I would like to see our country becoming more united. And I do not believe that this bill will bring us together. It will further divide us. So I will urge people to really think about this bill and think about its implication. And I will encourage more people to speak out against this bill. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, members, I understand that people are passionate about issues sometimes. But the bottom line, we can never ignore uh, the systemic racism. As you're all aware of, we passed the, uh, the resolution in the House last year. And we have talked about it in this committee. And we'll keep on continuing to address the injustice, the lack of resources, the lack of development for the BIPOC community. So it's something that we have addressed it in many places. And uh, we will have more conversation as a state, as a country, in moving forward. Mr. Chair. That, uh, who's, who's, who's speaking? My name is Farheel Khalif. Can I say something? Uh, please be brief, one minute, so, so we, can pick, we can take the two amendments. Yes. Um, if we, I was just asking, this was not correct. Please to introduce, oh, introduce, hi, sorry. introduce yourself uh, for the record and proceed. My name is Farheel Khalif, Executive Director of Voice of East African Women member of the NAACP, the vice president of Minnesota Dakota's NAACP. And I'm here today in, in, and try to testify, but I don't know uh, how we get into that person. It's, it's not the person who was, uh, there's a couple of people who was here. It, 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 it is here today to testify for this bill. And I hope you give the opportunity for them to do that. Thank you. Uh, you had the floor to speak on uh, the bill, but I wanted to okay. make sure that we do have other okay. bills. Uh, yeah, so let me we continue. will give you the opportunity. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Um, I just want to make sure that, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank you for the opportunity for giving us today for to hear House File 784. Um, and I also want to thank the members of the committee who is here also giving us the opportunity to be here. And I just want to remind you that the African-American and African immigrant communities in the state of Minnesota, when it comes to the businesses, are really, really are, are, are struggling. And also we are growing and when, as you see everywhere, not only the Twin Cities, the Minneapolis and St. Paul, but we are, uh, we are presence everywhere when it comes to uh, the suburb and, and the urbans and everywhere. So I'm asking my, also I'm also talking to not only my Democrat friends, but also my Republican friends in the committee today, especially my friend, Ron Hamilton who understands the struggle that the African-American and the African immigrants are going through economically in this country and systematic, systematically is being targeted when it comes to contracts and when it comes to our, and the lack of access of equal opportunity for any things that are we looking for the black, blacks in America. This bill is historic. This bill is the opportunity here we'll give it to your members to vote on to hear the voices of the blacks in America. And I disagree. The person before me who was spoken about that, this bill directly talking about the African-American and African immigrant communities in the state of Minnesota. Disproportionately, it's been affected systematically, racist, and everything that we're talking about this country today. This bill will unite, will heal, will bring us together. We are not asking more. This is just a down payment for our communities. And I'm hoping that since Dr. Corey Bruce is on the call right now, he is here to testify. And Mr. Chair, and I hope that you give Dr. Corey to say a couple minutes to testify. And I know you have a lot of things that you are looking forward to this. As an NAACP member, as a member of the civil right, the oldest civil right in the country, this is the opportunity that my Republican friends and Democrat friends have today 
to vote on and support this bill. And I don't know who was the person before me talking about this bill will divide us. No, this bill will unite us, will support the bring whites, blacks, native, Latinos, Asian communities together and thank come you, together Chair. as united. I just wanna say thank you, Mr. Chair and members, please consider and vote for this bill and support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Khalif. So I wanted to make sure that I give a minute. He will be the last person to testify, uh, Dr. Bruce Corey. Please welcome to the committee, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Noor, Vice Chair Zhang, Representative Hamilton, uh, and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Bruce Corey. I'm an economist at Concordia University and with the Alana Brain Trust. I testify in support of House File 784, which aims to address serious racial disparities experienced by African Americans in Minnesota by proposing comprehensive investments in multiple areas. Investment in the African American economy in Minnesota is not a zero sum game. Rather, investments in the African American company will help the larger economy in Minnesota grow through increases in output, jobs, income, and federal and state and local tax revenue. For example, uh, we, uh, the Alana Brain Trust Implan economic model illustrates this positive impact of the investments of this bill. It will result in uh, over $400 million uh, growth, an estimated growth in output in Minnesota, uh, around 3,000 jobs, and 57 million in federal, state, and local taxes. For the specific uh, uh, investment of $50 million in African-American businesses, uh, the model says that this would support an increase in 68 million increase in output in the Minnesota economy, supporting almost 500 jobs and 24 million in wages, and uh, around 10 million in federal, state, and local taxes. And just one uh, quickly, uh, the, the reason why we support African-American businesses uh, through these unique programs is that as a community, they are not ex accessing uh, resources through uh, these formal financial channels. It's been documented, and I've done the research on the PPP program. Uh, most of the, among all the Alana communities, African-American businesses, uh, owners, relied more on the nonprofit lending network for, for loans and assistance. And so uh, the investments of this committee, uh, of this bill to build up that capital and technical infrastructure for this business is right on track because another important fact is that a typical African American business is very small, about 80,000 in revenue compared to about half a million of, of a white business. And so there's much more potential to grow and I would strongly uh, encourage the support of this bill. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, your testimony. I know I don't want to ignore the uh, Ms. Castile, who is with us. Uh, if you wanted to just speak for a minute, and we'll go to the amendments. I'm sorry to the other testifiers. We do have other bills before us. Uh, Ms. Uh, Valerie Castile, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, my name is Valerie Castile. I'm the mother of Philando Castile, and I just wanted to say that uh, I would appreciate it very much if you guys would support House File 784. Um, my son Philando started working when he was 13 years old because of a training program designed for the African American children in the neighborhood. And after he worked for uh, this small um, summer program, he worked during the school year, he kept his grades up and uh, he became gainfully employed since the age of 13 because he had the accessibility and, um, uh, you know, being able to be trained in small motors and uh, fixing bicycles. And I just wanted to say that you, you can feed a man for a day, but if you teach him how to fish, he'll eat forever. And we're asking for an investment of a pole and a hook, and we will have the real with our strength. And uh, I appreciate you guys taking the you know, the time to uh, hear this bill. It's a large bill, yes it is, but it's designed to address systemic racism because once we do that, then we can calm self-sufficient and um, it'll uh, decrease crime and 
uh, our neighborhoods will become safer if uh, we can get uh, allocated money in order for us to train our children. E education is everything. If our children are educated and trained, uh, they will go out to be productive, productive citizens. So I just want to thank you very much. And uh, uh, the young man, uh, Alexander, um, thank you for you very much for your thoughts. And um, we appreciate you being here. But uh, we're trying to do this for the African-American and um, African immigrants. And we're asking for that investment. It's an investment and it will pay off you know, once the uh, programs get going and people become employed. We're trying to see our kids be employed. That's it. We want better for our children. We have seen uh, black businesses go, but they never come back. Over the course of the years that I have been here in Minnesota, I have seen uh, a decline in um, entrepreneurship and business ownership. So I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me. Thank you very much and enjoy Thank the you, rest Ms. of your day. I, I appreciate your testimony and we, we appreciate all the work that you've been doing in the community with that. Uh, Representative Frankie, you do have two amendments. Uh, which amendment did you want to start with? Sure, thank you. Um, let's just go in order here. Let's start with the A4 amendment. I'd like to move the A4 amendment, Mr. Chair. A4 amendment is before the committee. Uh, Representative Frankie, did you want to explain what the four, A4 amendment does? Sure, Mr. Chair. Um, A4 amendment, just uh, page two, line 15, after the period in search of grants made under this section must be allocated to the organizations located in the cities listed in clause two on a per capita basis. I thought around that was, Mr. Chair, um, it, this section talks about setting up centers in some of our major cities. As we know, the size of our communities are different and I would like to make sure that that money is distributed equitably um, throughout the communities. Um, as we know in Minneapolis, our BIPOC population is larger than in Mankato. So I just wanna make sure that those funds are being allocated appropriately. I've spoken with uh, the author of the bill. Uh, he will accept the amendment uh, without any discussions, members. See none. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? See none. The amendment is adopted. Representative Frankie, you do have another amendment. You're muted. Sorry about that, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair members. I would like to move the A5 amendment. Uh, proceed to represent Frankie. Uh, represent Frankie moves A5 amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. The A5 amendment states that no later than January 15th, 2023, the commissioner must submit a report to the chairs and ranking minority members of the legislative committees with jurisdiction over the economic development detailing the grants awarded under this section. Um, including information on the geographic distribution of those grants and how the funds are expected to be used. Uh, thank you. No, uh, thank ahead, you, Mr. Mr. Frankie. Uh, I've spoken also with the author of the bill in regards to that amendment. He accepts the amendment. Uh, any discussions? Any discussions? See none. Uh, all those in favor of the A5 amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed? See none, the amendment is now adopted. Any further comments, Representative Franklin? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll just wait till we get to the questions. Uh, we do have now the bill before us as an amended. Uh, did you have any questions for the bill author before he goes yes, to- Thank you, Mr. Chair, I will go ahead. Um, I guess I would start by saying, and, and I know there's a lot of emotions around this bill. Um, I would like to, start by um, asking the representative uh, a question. Um, I guess from reading this entire bill, uh, and um, I wanna say Representative Thompson that I get this and I try to put myself in everybody else's shoes when considering decisions. Um, so one way I thought about this in my own, my own um, arena is, is, you know, I place racism as a 
looking at it through the eyes of addiction. And the first thing we need to do when it comes to addiction is admit there's a problem. And um, I have no problem admitting we have a problem. So on that note, um, my question to the bill author is, if with this bill, we are trying to get at systemic racism from reading this bill in all the different sections, and I will try to limit my comments to just our section after this, but it just seems that we're throwing a lot and a lot of money at a system that is broken without a lot of guidelines, guardrails, requirements, or specifications. So um, moving forward, I'm wondering how do you think that by just throwing all this one-time money at a situation, are we gonna get at this egregious situation that needs to be fixed and just moving forward, how can we do that without placing in some, I don't know, requirements on how do we get there? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much, Representative uh, Frankie. Before I give it to Representative Thompson to, to answer the question, I just wanted to note by 150, we are going to be taking the vote on this bill. And I know there's uh, four other individuals who have raised their hand. Representative Thompson. I do have an answer for that. I, I, I normally I would allude to uh, to uh, my my uh, key testifier, but Representative Frankie, I want to make sure that I I uh, answer your question the way I see fit, and I want to throw it back at you and say, how does not investing in it, because that's what's been happening, not investing in my community, not investing in the people who are mis uh, underserved. How does that fix it? As a matter of fact, not investing in it has created a lot of crime in my community because black people are gonna eat. So if you see them in the store stealing Miracle Whip and a loaf of bread, it's because they don't have money. A lot of people in my community didn't get a $1,400 uh, um, stimulus check, right? And after the pandemic, we gonna be in an epidemic in my community. And so I, I throw that back at you and ask you, how does not investing in it for years, for years, not investing in my community, how does that fix systemic racism? Representative Frank, and then we go to the next uh, uh, member. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that answer, um, Representative Thompson. Um, you bring up a point for me that I'm actually agreeing with you and um, I'm willing to give you a positive vote out of this committee um, and we'll uh, continue to look at this bill and work forward. My problem is I wanna see results. I wanna see, I wanna see how do we get there? How do we do this work? Because I'm with you, my friend, you know what I mean? Um, but I also want to know that we're getting results and um, not, and we're protecting everybody. There's a lot of underserved communities. So I had other questions, Mr. Chair. I know the time is limited. So I'll just end with that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Representative Thompson. I believe the next person was uh, Representative Jogans, and then we'll go to Representative Emma Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll be quick. I just, uh, I, I wanna ask a, a question of Mr. Deputy, if this isn't the, the, the solution to getting to systemic racism, if he can offer a, a quick solution of what he thinks would be a better way to, to attack this problem. Representative Thompson. No, this is for uh, Mr. Deputy. One of the testifiers. All right, yep, uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, so what I think that we need to do is that we need to start really thinking about why are these community underserved? You know, first things first. So I honestly believe that that starts at, at home, okay? It starts with family, with family values of working hard, you know, persevering. All, um, all of these things are a natural fact of life. You cannot control what life throws at you, but you can control how you, you know, respond. So um, my parents taught me from- a If you can wrap up, uh, Mr. Deputy, we work. do have uh, yep. more people asking questions. Yep, work hard, okay? N nobody owes you anything. You need to work hard. You need to learn to, to work hard. Thank, and, thank and you, Mr. Deputy. We'll, so we'll, we'll go to uh, Liz Olson. And then I think uh, for my other members, we'll give uh, Liz Hamilton the closing. Uh, Representative Olson. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Thompson, for bringing this bill forward. Um, I just wanted to note for the section to the committee, I would have probably done it as a question, but I'll just maybe make it as a comment. Um, specifically, I love the part, not just about the funding, but the part in your, your bill, Representative Thompson, that talks about strengthening the entrepreneurial and business training and technical support. And I would have loved to hear a little bit more about that and how that would have impacted communities. I think that's great. It's not just the general grant program, but it's actually strengthening and bolstering the support to make sure businesses are successful. So I was going to ask about that, but in lieu of time, I'll just make that comment. And then I also want to say I heard loud and clear from my community, from the African heritage community in Duluth, the strong support of this bill. And when communities most impacted tell us what the solution is, I think it behooves us to listen. And I just encourage others members to support this bill. Thank you, uh, Representative Olson. Uh, Lead Hamilton. You have the final words before we we move on to the next bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, my apologies to all the testifiers. I don't have my camera on because my screen locks up. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm we're missing a great opportunity here um, to educate people like myself on this issue. Uh, it's not critical of you, Mr. Chairman. It's a critical of the legislative process. Uh, Representative Thompson. Um, I want to learn more. And Ms. Castillo, I want to hear more from you as well. Um, this is a, a huge issue. And individuals like myself, I want to learn. I need you to help educate me on these issues as well. I've been invited, and, and there's individuals on this call who have taken me through Minneapolis and St. Paul to help educate me on the issue. Um, and that's why I've, I've uh, supported various bills that uh, um, other people would think that uh, an individual like myself, um, my, my ethnicity, my, the, where, the place that I live, et cetera, they'd think I wouldn't support bills like that. But because people have taken the time to educate me on issues is a reason why I have done that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, my criticism today is that uh, we have a great opportunity to educate people like myself if we had the time to do it. And, you know, I, I look at this and uh, Representative Thompson, I'd, I'd like uh, uh, you to answer this question for me, if you could, please. You know, when we talk about the laws, the policies, the cultures uh, within the government entities and how that has led to a lot of the issues that we're experiencing today. And then we see a bill like your, yours, and I'm gonna say this just for briefly, I see the, the dollars invested in urban agriculture. Representative Thompson, I carry that bill because I visited with people in Minneapolis. I was the chairman of agriculture. And it's beautiful what's taking place there. And, and I'll say this too, in the Ag Committee, Prior to that bill, everybody that came into the Ag Committee and testified, they looked like me. A man or a woman, they looked like me. And I mean with the color of my skin. When I introduced that bill, that room was filled with people that looked like you, Representative Thompson. And it was beautiful. It was beautiful. We hadn't experienced that before in the Ag Committee. And now here we have a bill um, that, that's investing in this, brought to us from an individual that's been impacted impacted by the the disparities the discrepancies whatever and my question to you representative thompson is this is obviously a lot of money going towards directly to government agencies that many would say were part of the problem are you confident if this money is being invested are you confident that these programs will be successful um, because it's the same entities that will be trying to administer the programs. I guess that's my question to you. Representative Thompson, you do have a 10 seconds response. I'm sure that uh, Rep. Lyd Hamilton has requested uh, a follow up, and I'm sure you will uh, check in with him and uh, have more further conversation. Uh, Representative Hamilton, if you can see me uh, and, and see my face, you notice that I have been this skin color all my life. I cannot unzip this costume that I have on. Like, this is my skin color. I'm a black man. 
right? And you said 10 seconds, Chair. Um, and so we were dealing with uh, the um, workforce development piece to this, this bill. So I would love to entertain uh, your question over a cup of coffee. I would definitely love to sit down with you and talk with you. I think that we have a disconnect because you don't live our lived experiences and I don't live yours. And right. therefore you have no idea what's happening in our community. And I have no idea what's happening in yours unless I come, but that doesn't necessarily make it untrue. The other piece I'll say, and then I'll end here if you can allow me, is legislation help create a lot of the disparities that we see right now in this state and legislation can help fix them. And I promised this body in 2016 after the murder of my friend that I'd be right here as a legislator because that's how I was told, if you wanna change something, be the change. Well, here I am being the change that I wanna see. It's been a long, hard fight for me and my family to get here. Man, it's been a long, hard fight. And I lost my friend. It's systemic racism and we keep losing black men in this state. That's right. These black young men are killing each other on our streets. And that's because of the underinvestments. These black men are, are playing a, a game of a Grand Theft Auto with carjackers. And the only thing we get out of legislation is complaints, but no investments. We've already tried everything except for investing in these communities. We've tried to lock these problems away and they come back. They will keep coming back. And so thank I, I wanna have a cup of coffee with you and thank you so much, Representative Hamilton, for your comments. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Thompson. Uh, I hear your passion about uh, these issues, the impact on many of us, the things that we see on our streets, in our neighborhoods. I just wanted to conclude by yeah. renewing uh, if you'll allow me to renew uh, my motion, House File 784, as amended to be re-referred to Public Safety and Finance and Policy Committee. With that, Mr. I'm going to ask. Mr. Chairman, please. Lead Hamilton. Um, I, I'm just going to say this. Uh, Representative Thompson, let's have that cup of coffee. All right, let's have that cup of coffee. Educate me on this, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we have a motion before us, and I will ask uh, the committee legislative assistant, um, Mr. Chavez, to take the roll. Chair Noor. Aye. Chair Noor, aye. Vice Chair Jay Jong is excused. Lead Hamilton. No for now. Lead Hamilton, no. Baker. Baker is excused. Dabney. Dabney Bowtie. Debney votes aye. Frankie? The aye was an invite down to the Park Cafe for coffee. <laughs> Frankie, aye. Uh, Greenman? Aye. Greenman, aye. Haley? Haley? Jurgens? Jurgens, aye. Jurgens, aye. Kegel? Aye. Kegel, aye. Katiza Watun? Aye. Katiza Watun, aye. Olson? Aye. Olson, aye. Tujong? Aye. Tujong, aye. Haley? Uh, Mr. Haley, no. Haley, no. Mr. Chair, the motion prevails with. We can uh, hear you. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Chair, the motion prevails with nine ayes, two no's, two excused. With nine eyes, uh, two no's, and two excused, uh, the motion prevails. Uh, Representative Thompson, you're on your way to the Public Safety uh, Committee. So with that, we move to the next bill, which is House File. Uh, it's House File 875. I see Representative Foley. Um, since we don't have our vice chair today, I move ha House File 875 to be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Lee, please proceed. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, committee members for this opportunity to present House File 875 on behalf of uh, Representative Zhang. Uh, this bill appropriates $4 million from the general fund to the African Economic Development Solutions for building construction that uh, supports business incubation, workforce development, and technical assistance to support new and existing African immigrant entrepreneurs aim at addressing uh, the pervasive economic inequities that we are seeing. And uh, 300 is for the uh, building construction and one, 
Three million, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Chair, three million is for building construction and one million is for workforce development and technical assistance, including but not limited to business development, entrepreneur training, uh, business technical assistance, loan uh, and community development services. And Mr. Chair, I do have a group of testifiers that are here that could speak more to this uh, bill than I can. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Lee. Uh, with that, uh, we do have Mr. Ali Shire, uh on this bill. Please welcome to the committee, introduce yourself and proceed. Oh, hello, uh, my name is Yudan Alishire and I'm my small business owner. I am uh, uh, owner of a uh, part owner of Jigjiga Event Center. And our, um, I just wanted to testify to, um, to talk a little bit about our business. We started our business back in 2017. Um, and our mission uh, of our business was to really gather to provide it's a banquet hall space for the community. It's a space that, <clears throat> that we use to, for meetings and, and weddings and, and different type of avenues, uh, venues, I should say. And um, our business really tremendously suffered, uh, you know, being located, we're located in Lake Street in South Minneapolis, Lake in Bloomington. So we were really impacted by the unrest of uh, George Floyd. And in addition to that, this type of business that we're in is a banquet hall that requires uh, a gatherings of a lot of people. And so, as you know, the governor orders um, completely shut our business down. Uh, the way our, we're legally structured uh, was through 1099s as, as you know, this type of business is based uh, on, on, on events. And so we're, we're happy to uh, work with partners like AEDS uh, uh, that really helped us uh, walk through these different challenges. We went to the regular banks uh, and they were not able to uh, provide us all the different um, help that the state and the federal government was providing to uh, businesses with, uh, with better structure, uh, legal structure uh, that had all their 941s and their payrolls and, 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 and businesses that were in, in a better uh, situations. Um, so I, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm cutting off here. So I, our business, our, you know, customers are, our neighbors, the city itself. Um, and, and, and I think some of you guys have uh, been to our space uh, when we open our space and, and, and a lot of times just donated to the community and to our neighbors to be able to use the space to you know, get together and get our ideas together. Um, and so um, AEDS as an organization, uh, uh, was really critical. They helped us with, uh, with the marketing, uh, our website, uh, our business plan, national projections. We're losing you, uh, Ms. Stylish here, so. Yeah, so you can I'm, I'm sorry. I think I, I, I have my phone on GND, but somehow I'm able to, I think phone calls are still coming in for whatever reason. Can you hear me? Yes, please, if you can uh, uh, wrap your testimony. Okay, so it's re uh, really, it's quick. Uh, quickly, I'm here to support this bill and I'm here to su support AEDS as an organization. And we're here to encourage um, the legislators to work with organizations like this mm -hmm. because they are aware of what's going on in our community. They work with small businesses like ours um, and the big banks, we don't know about us. That's the, the, that's the really reality. I'm here. Um, I want to thank, thank you, Chairman, for um, inviting us and, and taking our testament. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Adishiri. Uh, the next person is uh, Mr. Holler. Please welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Hi, uh, I'm uh, representing Mr. Holler uh, on behalf of ITC Transit. My name is Frau. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and the committee uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm with ITC Transit and we um, specialize with type three transportation, uh, transporting students 
from home to school. And uh, our business is a small business. We started about with um, two to three employees. And uh, with the help of uh, AEDS technical support and um, loan packaging uh, for a startup business, um, we're happy. We're happy to announce that you know we employ over thirty um, employees in our organization. Um, as you guys know, uh, COVID has restricted all of those um, um, op our operation and scaled us down. Many of our staffs are laid off. And we are working on um, hopefully getting everything back up as schools opening. Um, one of the key things for small businesses is knowing to find where resources are. And um, organizations like AEDS are uh, fantastic and reaching out, making sure they do their due diligence to research and uh, provide those support. And um, a lot of small businesses and um, minority businesses go to uh, AEDS to receive those support. And we ask um, in support of this house bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee for giving me this time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Devo. The next person is uh, Mr. Dr. Dalu. Welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Honorable Mohammed Noor and uh, the committee for giving me this opportunity to testify on behalf of uh, AEDS. My name is uh, uh, Abraham Dalu. Uh, I'm the owner and the administrator of uh, ANA Reliable Home Health Care. Uh, we provide um, uh, home health care uh, such as uh, personal care assistance, um, private duty nursing, and the various uh, waiver services uh, for the last eight years. And uh, during uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic shutdown or curfews uh, declared by the governor of uh, Minnesota, uh, we continued working as essential uh, uh, workforce, uh, providing cares to those who need it. Uh, we never missed a day, regardless of the difficulties imposed on us uh, by uh, COVID-19. So we consider uh, to be fortunate to be in business uh, today. And, uh, you know, at the beginning of our uh, business, I basically come from a pharmaceutical background uh, doing research. Uh, but when my wife and I, uh, who is a registered nurse, uh, decided to start our own business, uh, providing home care services was something uh, uh, mutually agreed upon both of us. And uh, at that time, of course, uh, we did not have an experience to run a business. Uh, and uh, ADIS uh, uh, just uh, reached out to us and walked us through the initial processes that uh, businesses uh, should go through, uh, such as um, providing uh, bookkeeping trainings, um, uh, providing uh, uh, marketing materials, such as business card brochures, so that we can effectively uh, reach out to the communities we uh, intended to reach out. And uh, as you know, uh, uh, ADS provides uh, much more services to businesses like ours, um, like assistance uh, with uh, COVID-19 related uh, PPP. Uh, and uh, during the civil unrest, they fundraise to support uh, uh, African-American um, and African uh, immigrant owned businesses and providing loans. And uh, today, uh, as a result of uh, their efforts, uh, many businesses are in, uh, in uh, staying in business. And in closing, uh, I'm, uh, of course, as I indicated, I'm here to fully support uh, the House Bill 875, uh, uh, which provides um, ADS uh, more uh, capacity to even do more uh, to the African immigrant communities. In closing, I want to leave you with the research done by our own Dr. Bruce Corey. And according to the 2015 Concordia University study, over 300 African immigrant owned businesses um, statewide generated $281 million and employing uh, thousands of uh, immigrants. So this is why we need to support ADS uh, so that it continues doing more 
so that uh, all immigrants in the, in the state of Minnesota are profitable, supporting themselves and supporting the uh, state at large. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and the committee. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dalu. So with that, I don't have anyone else who signed up for, to testify. Uh, discussion members or questions. See none, I know we have had conversations with uh, uh, the director, uh, Mr. Gilgalu, and he's been before us several times uh, with, uh, with the work that they do uh, in partnership with DEED and others. So we look forward to having more conversation in terms of supporting businesses impacted by COVID-19 pandemic. And I look forward to working with all the uh, nonprofit CDFIs and we will, um, we will uh, give the opportunity for the closing remarks to Chair Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members for this uh, consideration and look forward to uh, working with all of you to see if uh, we could help out these uh, business owners. Thank you all. Uh, thank you. I renew my motion, House File 875, delayed over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. With that, I transfer the chairmanship to represent uh, Kutiza Watun. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members, next on our agenda is House File 2007. Um, Chair Nor, would you like to move your bill? Uh, yes, um, I do have House File 2007 uh, that I, I move House File 2007 to be laid over for possible inclusion, Madam Chair. Very good. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, to your bill. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. This is uh, a grant program for the Emerge um, Community Development, which is actually in my district. Uh, this is the Opportunity Center, and they're focused on addressing the challenges many people are having to getting back to work. And I have uh, individuals uh, from the, uh, the Opportunity Center with us today who will uh, tell us a little bit about their programs, and I ask for your support. With that, uh, Madam Chair, I'd like to invite the testifiers. Thank you. Uh, first on the list, we have uh, Muhammad Ali. Um, please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair and committee members. Uh, before I go, I'm going to share a screen with if you could uh, introduce yourself and, and who you're oh. with, Mr. Ali, thank you. I'm a Senior Director of Work Class Programs at Emerge Community Development. Thank you. Um, and I will share. My colleague Said Bihi and I are pleased to be here to share some information about the Cedar Riverside Opportunity Center. The Cedar Riverside Opportunity Center was launched in 2017 as a partnership of Hennepin County, Hennepin Library, the city of Minneapolis, Minneapolis College, and Emerge, along with key employers and institutions, including Fairview Hospital, Oxford College and the University of Minnesota. The Opportunity Center operates adult and youth employment, pre-employment readiness, several career pathway trainings, financial education, AMFIP services, and other youth education services. The Opportunity Center's purpose is to connect community residents to economic opportunities through jobs, and careers. Cedar Riverside is a community made up mainly of high density apartment living with some of the lowest incomes and highest rates of unemployment in the state of Minnesota and also in the region. The majority of residents are East African and are striving to make gains in employment and education. However, this community, this community has been disproportionately impacted by job losses 
during the pandemic. During these challenges, the community has tremendous assets with close proximity to employment centers and is highly transit accessible to get to where jobs are located. We have two train stations in Cedar Riverside. One goes to Paul of America, one goes to St. Paul. And people are eager to make economic progress. I would like to invite Saeed Bihi, my partner. Very good, thank you, Mr. Ali. Um, next, we do have Saeed Bihi. Uh, please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. You're muted, Mr. B. Oh, good afternoon, and thank you, Madam Chair. As uh, my colleague Mohammed uh, mentioned, I am Saeed Bihi, and I work for the city of Minneapolis as a center uh, manager for the Cedar Riverside Opportunity Center. Mohammed and I co lead uh, the partnership that convenes at the center. Our work is uh, data driven, and I uh, and we are pleased to report to you that in 2020, in spite of the COVID pandemic, uh, is everyone listening to me? Oh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Thank oh, you. In spite of the COVID pandemic, we serve 634 individuals through a range of important services. 111 people obtained employment, with nearly half of those exceeding uh, the wages of $15 an hour. 26 youth were placed in jobs or internships. Hundreds of people received virtual trainings and education services, and 38 of those people obtained certificate credentials in either healthcare, commercial driving license, IT or other trainings. During the pandemic, we have broadened our work out to help 129 residents obtain laptops and digital access, and many others with food uh, support and other family financial support during this very difficult time in our state and community. Coming out of the pandemic this year, we feel that funding support is critical for the center to move forward and respond to the demands to reconnect our community to the workforce opportunities and career trainings. Funding is also needed to replace state and county funding that is ending. The team looks forward to partnering with DEED to build uh, out a robust work plan and results to forward all this work during 2021 and 2022. And thank you very much for uh, having us and we look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Um, that's all that we have for testifiers today. So we will move on to member questions and discussion. Um, I don't have any hands raised right now. Uh, members, do you have any questions for either Mr. Chair or the testifiers? Yes, I do. Oh. I actually do have a oh. question. Hello? Sorry, um, we're actually only taking uh, member testimony at this time. Oh, OK. I thought you had questions for you. Can you let me know when you can ask, uh, when you're asking the questions for the general, for everyone that's on the meeting? Well, so everybody, um, the, the public has the opportunity to testify and share their thoughts on the bill. But then uh, members are able to ask questions. Uh, the representatives can ask questions of the author or of the testifiers. But the public isn't able to ask questions. OK, that's what I'm saying. Let me know when the public is able to ask questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chair, still seeing none, would you like to um, offer any closing, closing thoughts? Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I know uh, this is a vital um, entity in, in my district and also supporting the city and the county. Uh, I know we have talked about finding another pathway for the direct appropriation is something that we will start having honest conversation. And I look forward uh, for your support in some of the projects that we will be bringing forward. So with that, 
uh, I appreciate uh, you taking the time to listen to uh, the testimony on this bill. Certainly. So I, I renew my motion, oh, House good. file, House file 2007 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Right. Um, with that, I will just note that um, anyone with further thoughts from the public should follow up um, with Chair Noor after um, after the committee is over today. And um, since Mr. Chair renews his motion that House File 2007 be laid over for possible inclusion in the committee's uh, budget bill, then um, we will move on to our next bill. Uh, and I will hand the virtual gavel back to Chair Noor. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, with that, uh... Will you please move your bill, House File 2020? And we do have a few minutes and hopefully we can extend based on uh, just for a few minutes. I'm asking for the House Info. Travis will let me know if we can extend a few minutes. Uh, please okay. uh, move your bill and tell us about it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would move House File 2020 to be laid over for possible inclusion in the committee's omnibus bill. And um, happy to be here to talk a little bit about the SciTech internship program today. Um, so House File 2020 provides $101.75 million in funding for the uh, SciTech internship program, which is run by the Minnesota Technology Association or MinTech. Um, this program connects college students who are studying science, technology, engineering, and mathematics with paid internships at small and medium-sized businesses across Minnesota. This program is open to employers with fewer than 250 employees worldwide. It's open to Minnesota students in STEM fields who are halfway through their two-year, four-year, or a graduate degree program. And they're also, it's um, out-of-state residents attending school here in Minnesota are also eligible. The goal is to attract and retain talented students to remain here in Minnesota's STEM workforce after their graduation. MinTech recruits students with an emphasis on um, women and students of color and small Minnesota businesses to participate and they facilitate the connections between students and employers via a web portal. Businesses maintain the hiring authority and they receive dollar for dollar match to cover 50% of the intern's wages up to $2,500. Then the, um, this $1.75 million in funding will provide at least 400 internships over the next two years. So um, today we have uh, an employer and two interns who have participated in the program. But first, I would like to introduce one of my constituents, um, Jeff Tollison from MinTech, to provide a brief overview of the program. Mr. Tollison, welcome to uh, the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jeff Tollefson, and I, I do serve as the president of the Minnesota Technology Association. Um, and I'm going to be very brief because you're not going to want to hear from me. You're going to want to hear from uh, those that have been impacted by the program. But suffice it to say that our economy needs more STEM talent. It's a digital world today, and we need to be investing in our youth to fill these important roles, to propel our innovation economy forward, and we need to create a more inclusive technology workforce and ecosystem. And with that, I want to turn this over to my colleague, Becky Siegmeyer, who runs the program. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so the, Ms. Uh, um, Siegmeyer, please uh, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Becky Siegmeyer, and I'm the director of the SciTech Internship Program. Since 2012, the SciTech Internship Program has been connecting college STEM majors with paid internships in small Minnesota companies. Small businesses need help connecting to and paying for talent, and students need help connecting to opportunities that provide hands-on experience, and SciTech is that connector. In addition, SciTech provides employers with a wage match that covers 50% of the intern's wages, capped at $2,500, and employers actually invest $1.75 on top of every dollar provided by the state. SciTech's mission is to build and retain Minnesota STEM workforce, and this program works. Since 2012, SciTech has connected nearly 2,100 students to internships. These are well-paying jobs in high-demand industries, including technology, engineering, medical devices, and manufacturing, and the average pay is $18 an hour. 30% of internships are, have been in greater Minnesota, with more than 80% of SciTech interns staying in Minnesota after graduation. While Minnesota needs to retain all of its STEM talent, we do focus our recruiting on women and students of color who are both underrepresented in STEM fields 
In 2021, 61% of applicants and more than half of our hires, 52%, have been women and students of color. SciTech is only open to small Minnesota companies with fewer than 250 employees worldwide. And while the cap is at 250, last year, 73% of hiring companies had 50 employees or fewer, and the median size was just 21 employees. The true impact of SciTech is best shared by those who have benefit, benefited from the program, and we've invited three guests to share their stories, beginning with Angie Conley of Abilitech Medical. So thank you for your time and investment in SciTech. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Sigmar. Ms. Conley, uh, welcome to the committee. Introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Chairman Noor and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Angie Zavaral Conley. I'm the founder and uh, pr president CEO of Abilitech Medical, which is located in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. We have four full-time employees, um, not sorry, four. Um, we have seven full-time employees and 12 contract employees. We've developed an exoskeleton for the arms to help people with neuromuscular weakness to do basic activities of daily living, to eat and drink and feed yourself, but quite literally open doors. Uh, this month, we begin a 35 patient study at the University of Minnesota and Gillette Children's of muscular dystrophy patients. Additionally, we have strong partnerships with the Courage Kenny Rehabilitation Institute at Alina and Health Partners Neuroscience Center. Uh, we've won some nice awards, both for our innovation and business strategy, which include the Minnesota Cup um, Grand Prize and the Techni Award. And we've been recognized nationally for uh, and cited to, um, several times as a top startup. And to Representative Haley's earlier um, comment, we've raised $12 million of capital. $11 million has come out of uh, outside of the state of Minnesota. So we really view this as an opportunity and its own stimulus to our economy. We've hired five interns through the Minnesota SciTech program over the past three years, and they've been a really important part of our research and development team. They've supported computer animated design, engineering, 3D printing, software development. They have um, were important, an important part of our device building and test fixtures, which was required um, to enable us to list with the FDA. The SciTech program allowed us to really recruit top and diverse talent um, and provided a great value for our company um, at an affordable rate. We are a you know, um, an early startup and have appreciated this support tremendously. And in turn, I also view this as an opportunity for the interns. The, our interns have gone on to get valuable experience from Abilitech and continued their work at Medtronic, at Tesla, which is, has a facility in Brooklyn Park, and many other Minnesota companies. I strongly believe and support the SciTech program. It's an important part of the Minnesota ecosystem, supporting companies, universities, and students who are eager to uh, gain valuable work experience. And I'd ask you to renew this funding for an important program that has made valuable con contributions to Abilitech, business, education, and our economy. So thank you very much for your consideration. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your testimony and your contribution to the state of Minnesota. Uh, so I do have uh, Mr. Uh, Ajagbusi. If I said it incorrectly, please let me know. Introduce yourself for the record and please proceed. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Daniel Ajabusi. I'll be graduating the University of Minnesota Twin Cities with a bachelor's degree in computer engineering in the fall of 2021. I act as the current chair for the university's branch of uh, Institution of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and I'm a board member of the university's branch of the National Society of Black Engineers. Uh, when I discovered the SciTech program in my freshman year, I was able to join because I had accrued college credit while I was in high school. All of my attempts to find an internship uh, for the summer up until this point were unsuccessful. Having nearly applied to every relevant position on Handshake, a platform the university uses to match students with employers, I was beginning to lose hope. Upon discovering the SciTech program, I found, a place, I found places to apply that I wouldn't have otherwise known were hiring. Because SciTech primarily works with smaller companies, 
it's a lot easier and more manageable for people who are new to job hunting. In my time with the program, I've completed two internships, the first one being at Abomath and the second one being with Abilitech Medical. Uh, for this position, I was primarily in charge of watching the machines while they stress tested the armatures, uh, but I was able to help out in a handful of other ways, such as suggesting modifications for several tests, compiling document reports, and uh, I was able to use some of the skills that I've been developing in class to automate some of their systems. I'm thankful that my early work experience was with a small company because being brand new to industry can be overwhelming. In many ways, schools prepared us for uh, life after graduation, but in a lot of other ways, it hasn't. I don't think anything can truly be equal to the experience of having an internship, especially when you're given the freedom to decide what uh, best way to tackle any given problem. You get truly invested and you do your best work when you have that freedom. And all of my internships at, or all my internships from SciTech or from the SciTech program have allowed me to this such autonomy. I think especially now the program is extremely beneficial. Getting an internship is a lot harder than it used to be. I've seen a lot of my peers lose their internships at big name companies because of everything that's happened these last couple of months. But they were still able to find work because of the SciTech program. It's for this reason that I believe it's extremely beneficial to all students that partake in it. I urge for the funding of the SciTech program to continue because it allows more chances for students to find internships. This program has allowed me to challenge myself and help others and build crucial workplace skills while doing something I'm passionate about. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, and we appreciate all your successes and uh, looking forward to see what you will be able to accomplish. Uh, the next person is uh, Ms. Rios. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, introduce yourself uh, for the record and proceed. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Tatum Rios. In 2019, I graduated from Inver Hills Community College with Associate of Science degrees in Chemistry and Engineering Fundamentals. However, my strong desire to learn led me to transfer to the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, where I'm now studying for my Bachelor of Chemical Engineering with a minor in Computer Science. I first heard about the SciTech Internship Program at an engineering club meeting at Inver Hills Community College in the fall of 2018. After learning about the great benefits of the program, I decided to sign up. I wasn't actually looking for an internship at the time I registered for the program, but I wanted to have my profile complete when I was ready to begin my search. One day I received an email from Brianna Murphy, who was my former supervisor at Innovative Service Technologies, and she offered me an interview for an analytical chemistry and quality assurance internship position. I thought, well, why not? I don't have much to lose, I, and I went in for an interview. I was offered the position, I was really happy, but I was also quite surprised. I was 18 at the time and wasn't actually fully confident in my own abilities. However, Bree saw something in me that I did not see myself, and I'm forever thankful for that. This internship changed my life. It gave me the reassurance that I was capable of becoming a successful scientist and engineer. Throughout my time at ICER Tech, I have learned a lot, and I've gained an incredible amount of confidence in my own abilities. I have been able to accomplish things that I never thought I would be able to. Because Isotech is a small company, I was put in a hands-on environment where I was surrounded by people who believed in me and most importantly, trusted me. During my first internship, I analyzed coding solutions and solid reagents for quality control using various laboratory techniques. I developed a new quality analysis method and I got to assist in quality investigations. During my second internship, which is my current internship at Isotech, I get to formulate experimental batches of coating solutions, dip coat and friction test substrates, and work with a pipetting robot to coat cell culture plates. My internship experience is what helped me decide to pursue chemical engineering. I'll admit, there was a time when I didn't even think I was capable of becoming an engineer. And this stemmed from the fact that I'm a minority first generation college student, and I didn't believe that I fit in. I didn't grow up with STEM influence in my life, therefore I didn't have anyone encouraging me to pursue it. However, someone who pos positively influenced me was my Isotech supervisor, Brianna Murphy. Having a successful female scientist 
believe in me and my abilities changed the way that I perceived myself. I learned that I could achieve anything that I put my mind to, and I was meant to be an engineer and scientist. I can't express enough how grateful I am to have gotten my first internship with ICER, ICER Tech, and that's all thanks to the SciTech internship program. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Rios. Uh, we believe in you and the work you do, especially when it comes to computer science members, as you know, my background is computer science. It's something that I value. Uh, it's the new future that we're in. Uh, opportunities like this uh, through SciTech and also with the seal of approval from the uh, Minnesota Technology Association as you've had from the president, uh, Mr. Tollefson. This is an incredible program. I had the opportunity to virtually visit with the students and the employers and to see what they've been doing over the summer before even uh, the session began. Uh, they're truly doing a great program and have had opportunity to refer some young people who are looking for technology assignments or internship and uh, the program and the quality is excellent. So with that, I wanted to open up for any discussions from members or questions. Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Katiza Watoon, for bringing this bill forward. Um, one of my questions, so from looking at the bill, is this uh, money only available to the company while the student or intern is in school? I can answer Robert, that. Sorry, Mr. Ms. Sig Ms. Sigmar, go ahead. Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, that's, yes, the, the program is open to uh, current students. Uh, they can remain in the program until um, until they graduate and then stay in the program through that summer. Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that answer. Um, I guess then that would lead me to another question, Mr. Chair. Um, and I'm not sure who would be best to answer this. Well, all of these schools must be Minnesota schools that they are hired from. Ms. Sigma. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, Representative Frankie. All of the students either attend school in Minnesota or if they are Minnesotans who go to school out of state, we, are, we want them to come back and do their internships in Minnesota as well. Representative Frankie. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that clarification. I guess just reading this bill, Mr. Chair and members, um, I'll just make a brief statement. Um, when we talk about retaining and bringing in talent into Minnesota, um, I think something to think about going forward in this virtual world is, is somehow putting that parameter into legislation because we want that talent to stay within our system and, and contribute to this economy. So that was just a, an observation I was noticing that, you know, not specific to this bill, but something that we should all think about going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, any other discussion before we go to the closing statement? See none. Um, I just wanted to appreciate everyone who came before us to testify for all the bills, including this bill. Looking forward to supporting the Scientech, uh, uh, the program that they do. So with that, Representative Cortizo Tune, your closing remarks and renew your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thanks to all the testifiers today. I'm so proud of all the good work that um, Abilitech and the other companies are doing here in Eden Prairie and the work that uh, Mr. Tollison is doing with um, MinTech. And so thank you so much for sharing your experiences, Mr. Agabusi and Ms. Rios. We do believe in you. I'm so impressed with uh, the work that you have accomplished thus far. Um, imposter syndrome is is real, and um, and I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to see yourself um, achieving the, the dreams and the things that you have set out to do and that this program has been a positive impact um, on your life. And I, I see you accomplishing a lot of good things here in Minnesota in the years to come. Uh, members, I appreciate your support. Mr. Chair, I would renew my motion that House File 2020 be laid over for possible inclusion. Well said. So uh, with that, members, we don't have any other agenda, agenda items before us. So the meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much. Thank you.